That's the second epistle of John. Uh, 303 words. And the third epistle is even shorter and contains 299 words. And they only have one chapter each. The last books in the, before Revelation all have one chapter each. Jude has one chapter. Second and third epistle. There's no way you can figure out what date these things were written. Most people, uh, most scholars teach the Gospel of John was written somewhere about 86, whatever it is, and the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, were written somewhere around 89 or 90, and the book of Revelation that John wrote is written somewhere around 90 and 91, but you can't prove that. And the way in the world to prove that, a lot of stuff just conjecture. Uh, the oldest piece of the Bible they've ever found is a little old piece of paper called papyrus. When they find a piece of papyrus, they give it a number. So if they find three pieces, they number one, two, three, in the order they find them. And the oldest piece of the Bible anybody's ever found is a little piece of paper, which they call P-52. And P-52 contains part of John 18. John 18. That's the oldest piece they've ever found. And that piece of paper they found is somewhere between there. So they might have got the original, but of course the chance is real slim. The original was undoubtedly copied 30,000 times a year, or for every year after it was written. And when you study manuscript evidence and stuff in school, there are a lot that don't tell you. Uh, for example, your chance of recovering any original are 350 billion to nothing, because any book that was copied over and over again by hand is going to fall apart. This Bible right here, I've had to rebound now. I've had this Bible here for uh, 10 years. It's the uh, third Bible I'm, I've worn out. Two have worn out for this one. And this has been running now about uh, 10 years, and the pages are coming out, and they're turning black, and they're turning brown, and they're tearing. And I don't use it a whole lot. It's on India paper. Now, can you imagine the condition the Bible would be in if it was written on newsprint? That stuff you got right there. And then 30,000 Christians copied it by hand, passing from one hand to another. And three guys copying at the same time, looking over each other's shoulders and smuggling that thing on ships and across deserts and their tunics and jackets and top of the hat. Can you imagine what condition that stuff would have been in 10, in ten years? It wouldn't have been there. So if you want to know why you can't find a complete Bible back to the first century, it's because a real Christian used this Bible. A Bible that comes apart always belongs to a Christian who hasn't. That's profound, brother, if you think about it. When you find a Bible's come apart, you'll find the Christian only that hasn't come apart. And when Christians come apart, it's because they come apart instead of their Bibles. And you find the Bible's been prayed over and wept over and used are King James Bibles. If you go to home and find Living Bible and Amplified and Good Speed and Wap and Moffat and Weymouth and RSV, you'll find them sitting there, nice pretty covers, nice pretty pages. One or two notes in them, three or four lines. There they are, just sitting there like a dead duck. And the reason why they're a dead duck is because God won't honor them. I can take you in this uh, place in this country and find you King James Bibles that are literally thumbed and prayed through. I have one Bible, the first Bible I had, I held so long my thumb went through the cover into the preface. I'm just carrying it in my hand. Thumb went right through the leather cover and through the cloth cover and through the, the uh, front piece into the preface of the book. And uh, I mean the Bible as much as early Christians did. So when you find one little old piece back there that far, you really got something. But that doesn't mean it's an original. It might have been the 50,000th copy of John somewhere. All right, second epistle of John. The elder. Well, John's an elder. I suppose Simon Peter was. I'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm sure Peter, James, and John were elders. 1 Peter chapter 5. When Peter speaks of himself, he says, 1 Peter 5, 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So it's uh, John writing. All right, second epistle of John, verse 1, The elder, we're talking about himself, unto the elect lady and her children. Uh, normal teaching is the elect lady is the church, and her children are saved people uh, that come from the church, body of Christ. But uh, that's, that's, again, you have to kind of fiddle with the thing. For example, uh, and her children, uh, I'm not a children of the, of the church, I'm a child of God. 
The church didn't begat me. Christ begat me. When you start saying the elect lady and her children, first thing you know, you start this stuff about the church being a mother. And then you get in a holy mother church, uh, which is an unholy uh, prostitute uh, harlot, according to Revelation chapter 17. Uh, my mother isn't the church anyway. Turn to Galatians. I have a different mother. And my mother is not the church. Galatians chapter 4. If you're saved, look how Paul used the term, my little children. Galatians 4, 19, my little children. Well, who's the mother of those children? Well, in the context you're looking at there, Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, my mother, not the church. So you make the elect lady the church while you get into trouble. All right, Second John 1, the elder of the elect lady. Who's the elect lady? I don't know who the elect lady is. But it's pretty hard to put the turn down on the church. The church is called the bride, the bride. Revelation chapter 21, she's called a wife. Ephesians chapter 5, she's called a chaste virgin. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, she's never called a lady. Never. I don't recall one place in either testament where the bride of Christ refers to as a lady. She's called my dove, my undefiled, but one in the Song of Solomon, along about chapter 6 but never a lady. Well, and the problem comes up is Israel ever referred to as a lady? <laughs> well, Israel refers to as a woman in Revelation chapter 12, and a virgin daughter in Jeremiah. And uh, he says, when Zion travailed, she brought forth, uh, when she travailed, she brought forth, and the woman compassed a man, a man child, that stuff back in the Old Testament. And she's called a cast-off wife of Jehovah back in the Old Testament. But I just offhand, I don't recall a place where she's called a, a lady. Let's go back to, um, oh, let's go back to Hosea in the Old Testament. Hosea 2.1, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife. That marriage has been dissolved. She's not my wife, neither am I her husband. The Lord says in case of divorce, no matter of two husbands and two wives, she's not my wife, I'm not her husband. Some folks have a time with the Bible. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries but from between her breasts. Adultery, fornication, grounds of divorce, and in such case, they're not husband and wife, not according to the Lord. Verse 5, for her mother hath played the harlot, she hath conceived them, so forth and so on. All right, then, so he says, she's no longer my wife. I put her off and put her away because of her sin. Now, verse 19 and 20, I'll remarry her. Remarry her, she's single. So I'll remarry her. Verse 19, I will betroth. I will betroth. I will betroth. 18, 19, 20. So Israel is a cast-off wife that's been put aside and been given a bill of divorcement and will remarry the Lord in the tribulation. Israel's a cast-off wife. The bride of Christ is a chaste virgin espoused to one husband. Now, what do you say? What is the elect lady? <laughs> I don't know. I know what the elect lady is. Or at the elder, under the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and the truth could be Christ, or could be the truth of the Word. And not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. It could be Christ, or could be the Word. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, it could be the Word, or it could be Christ. It's, uh, it's variable. For example, go back to 1 John again in chapter 1, and look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. 1 John 1, 8. If we, talking about the saved people, Say we have no sin, the saved people. We, the saved people, deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, Christ is in them. Christ is in them, but the truth isn't in them. So there are many saved people in whom Christ dwells, but the truth don't dwell in them. Now, the incarnate truth is in them, Jesus Christ, but the truth is not in them. 
The Bible says, Love rejoices in truth. Charity rejoices in truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. The word of God doesn't dwell in all believers. Some believers don't take time to learn it. They don't take time to study it. They don't take time to memorize it. They don't believe what they do study. They don't retain what they study. They don't use what they study. And they don't apply what they study. So of them it can be said the truth doesn't abide in them. Now, the Lord is in them, but that's organic. That has to do with your spiritual setup. That has nothing to do with your practical living. All right, one. And not only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and... If it is Christ, which I doubt, but if it is, eternal security shall be with us forever. If it is Christ, it's eternal security in the passage. Three, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he's put Jesus Christ in distinction from the truth. So I'd say the truth in the passage is the truth about the Word, the truth about God, and the truth about doctrine, and the truth about things in general. And the Son of the Father in truth. Is that used again? Not as synonymous with Christ. In truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in truth. Look how it's used again. Verse 1, truth. Verse 2, truth. Verse 3, truth. Verse 4, truth. Verse 4, I rejoice greatly I found thy children walking in truth. Walking according to what's right. So I think the word truth there is probably not a reference to Christ, but according to just true living and practical things. Walking in truth, as we have received the commandment from the Father. Now I beseech thee, lady, whoever the lady is. Now, of course, you can say it's just some woman he wrote to. I mean, maybe he wrote the thing and just said uh, to the elect lady and sent it to a saved woman, see, which maybe he did. But boy, look at 13. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. No, no, no. Let's go back to Song of Solomon. Get over, get, really get confused. There are four different women in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 8. Song of Solomon 8 8. Song of Solomon 8 8. We have a little sister, and she hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? Who's that talking? Looks like the church. Look at verse 4. I charge thee, O daughters of Jerusalem, you stir not up, nor awake my love until he please. And he says about the sister, verse 9, chapter 8, verse 9, if she be a wall, we'll build upon her a palace of silver. And if she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Anybody give us any help? Can't get it for me. If she be a if she be a wall, we'll build upon her a palace of silver, and if she be a door, we'll enclose her with board to see her. The sister. Second John. I didn't tell you I knew all the answers. I know where they are, but I don't know all of them. Sam Jones, he said, he said, if I knew all the Bible, I'd know somebody wrote it didn't have any more sense than I did. A lot of truth in that. All right, 2 John 5. Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. You've got that all through 1 John. And you've got it all through John 13, 14, and 15. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Over there in John 15. And this is love, we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, singular, that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. That is ye, the elect lady, has heard from the beginning. Ye, the elect lady, should walk in it. Did the elect lady hear that? Did she hear Christ say that in John 15? If you love me, keep my commandments. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man this, and he down that lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Did she hear that? If she heard that, then she must be a reference to the 11 apostles. They're the only ones that ever heard it. 
You're going to wind up with a whole bunch of women before you get through that. You're going to wind up with an elect lady made up of the twelve apostles and a bride of Christ made up from Paul to the rapture and a tribulation virgin daughter of Jerusalem in the in, in uh, the tribulation and a bunch of Gentiles saved of every tribe. You got about you got about four different things there. All right, verse seven. Now we'll get into something we can understand. Many deceivers are entered into the world. That's true. Many deceivers went into the world, spiritual deceivers, religious deceivers, political deceivers, financial deceivers. The Bible said the devil deceived the whole world. And there never was a time on this earth when you had more deceivers than you got today. He said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And it goes, it, it's so much now. You know, American people have been watching that boob tube and that idiot box for so long that if they saw the truth, they think there was a trick to it. I mean, you can't you can't watch television two hours a day for ten years and not wind up as crooked as a dog's iron leg, because all you're getting is crooked stuff. I mean, you get a newscast, you know, it's crooked, it's twisted, it's slanted, it isn't given to you straight. Men a deceiver enter into this world. All right, he says the evil men and seducers shall wax worse, deceiving and being deceived. And nowhere is it done any better than religion. That's where it's done. Now you can take an RSV and put a black cover on it. Now Christian will buy it. I think he's getting the King James Bible. He's dumb Christian will buy a new school field Bible. You know, just suckers, you know, chumps. They pick up that new school field Bible and it says, the King James Version with the revised notes. The new school field Bible is not the King James Version. You say, how do you know it isn't? According to the law, it's not. According to court of law, if two texts don't match, they ain't the same text. I'm just waiting, you know, for some. You talk about deception, man. Take a, take a guy up here. This happened on television several times. A woman comes up here with a big goiter on her neck. Hey, would you use Christ? Healer, healer, you know. Goiter goes down. Somebody says, I saw it in my own eyes. Well, you didn't see the police capture on a plane a couple days later with that hose running on her dress and that plastic skin and that balloon on her there. You didn't see that, did you? But she let the air out of the balloon, the balloon went down, the plastic flesh went down. The Bible says in the last days, they're going to deceive, brother. They're going to deceive. I'll tell you, I've always appreciated the circuit court judges. I've been before four of them. I always did appreciate them <laughs> because uh, they, they, they impressed me as being interested in nothing but just the plain truth. And if you can't prove the truth, they don't care whether you die or go blind. And see me, that's a good approach to life. And I'm just waiting for some of the brethren to sue me someday, which they're going to. I mean, I'll goad them into it. <laughs> and listen, if they ever get if they ever get me into court, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull out all this stuff we're talking about. I'm going to say, Your Honor, here's a book that says it's the King James Bible, and it's a lie. I want this company sued, copyright taken away, and the publishing company put out of business. And let me tell you something, a judge in this country, save the law to look at those two texts and say they're the same. If the wording in this is different, they're not the same. But you take these dumb Christians, you can tell them anything, you know. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver not the deceiver, the devil, and an antichrist, not the antichrist, the antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the deceiver, the devil, but his kids have the same title. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Uh, the churches in America were taken over between 1914 uh, and 1970 by liberals, what we call Trinitarian pulpit. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, over here in Middletown and Dayton, Cincinnati, you have a Trinitarian pulpit. By that I mean the church was built and the pulpit was set up so the fellow who preached it believed that Jesus Christ was a member of the Godhead, a Trinitarian pulpit. And between 1914 and now, preachers worked their way into those pulpits that didn't believe Jesus was God. They didn't believe God was manifest in the flesh. They believed Jesus was a great teacher, and if you followed his example, it'd be all right. They believed Jesus was a social reformer, see, kind of like Engels and Marx. And the thing to do was uh, present a Jesus that you live like and, 
and then if you're a good little boy like Jesus, then you got to heaven, and since Jesus just wouldn't hurt a fly, you shouldn't hurt a fly, and since he turned the other cheek, you ought to turn the other cheek, and since he never got, you know, upset or disturbed, he used violent language, which he did, then you shouldn't. And then for 50 years, they put that junk in America, and now people in Dayton, Cincinnati, and Hamilton, Middletown, and Trenton think that a Christian is a, you know, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. We should pray for one another. Brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. You know. And you know, some guy like me, you know, Brother Wright comes through here, see. And, bah, you know, puts out a settling torch. Well, he couldn't be a very good Christian. You know. He doesn't have the sweet spirit of Christ. You know. He uses abusive language. <laughs> and makes inflammatory remarks. You know. Now, that, that stuff comes from an infidel in the pulpit, standing in a pulpit that was paid for, but people believe this Bible, he's a deceiver and he's an antichrist. Boy, you talk about abusive language. You know I'm mild. I am mild. You want to hear abusive language? How about this? Woe be unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that strain a knot to swallow a camel. You compass land and see to make one proselyte when you get him converted. You make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Fill up then the measure of fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Woe to you that for pretense make long prayer and devour widows' houses. You shall receive the greater damnation, you fools and blind, that outwardly appear righteous unto men, but inside are full of dead men, bones, and all hypocrisy. You are your father, devil, and lust of your father you will do. And he was a liar in the beginning, and abode not the truth. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, because he's a father of it. And which of you convinced me of sin? Why don't you hear me? He that is a God heareth God's word. You hear them not, because you're not a God. Now, man, you talk about abusive language, boy. Calling a guy, your daddy's a snake. <laughs> you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? You fools, you blind, you hypocrite. My land, what language? You know what that is? That's in Matthew 23. Matthew 23. The liberal picture of Christ, brethren, is not the Bible picture of Christ. The Bible picture of Christ is somebody who stands for some and don't give an inch. He went, he went there in the temple and took a scourge of a, a rope and slapped those people that dumped over the tables. Did you ever, did you ever in your mind, visualize that thing? And that was during a worship service, man. What if the ecumenical council meeting out there in the cow palace out in Frisco, you know, with all the fruits and everything? And here were these tables around, folks selling books, you know, and all this stuff for the ecumenical movement. And in comes some wild-eyed character there with a piece of rope about that long and knots in it and starts beating people in the head with it and <laughs> kick that table over there, boom, slap that table over that chain going all over the floor. What would you think of that? Somebody said, boy, he sure don't have the sweet spirit of Christ. <laughs> he was Jesus Christ. Our God is not uh, limited to Whistler's mother and the campfire girls. Uh, Exodus chapter 15 says, Our God is a man of war. All right, 2 John ch uh, verse 8. Look to yourselves. We say, watch your step. Look to yourself. Look to your own. Watch what you're doing. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, like wrought iron, the things you did, but that we receive a full reward. Now, that looks like a Christian can do something and then lose part of it as a reward. Notice John says that we have received a full reward, implying you can get a partial reward. Now, there are certain things that a Christian can lose, and I'll, give, I'll list them for you. Uh, we know the Christian can't lose eternal life, he can't lose Christ, but there's something he can lose. All right, number one, a Christian can lose assurance of salvation. He can lose that. You know you're saved one day and think you're not the next. You can lose assurance. You can lose your testimony. When I say testimony, I'm talking, I'm talking about your testimony, not your reputation. The modern conservative makes a mistake of confusing reputation with testimony. They say, well, a fellow hurt his testimony, meaning he hurt his reputation. And some of these folks with real reputations have no testimony at all. Your testimony is what you believe to be true and publicly declare and stand for. A testifier testifies. Your reputation is what men think you are. Your character is what God knows you are. There's a difference. 
All right, you can lose your joy. You can lose your joy. A Christian can be happy one day and sad the next. You can lose your joy. You can lose your rewards. You can lose your rewards. Let a man suffer loss, 1 Corinthians 3. You can lose your health. You can lose your health. You can't lose your soul. You can lose your health. You can lose your life. The Lord can take your life. You can lose your life. You can lose your inheritance. Paul says, those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So a Christian can lose seven things, his assurance, his testimony, his joy, his rewards, his health, his life, and his inheritance. But he cannot lose salvation. All right, John says, look to yourself. We lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. There's another warning like this. All right, Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that, that fast which thou hast. Not talking about salvation. What's it talking about? A crown. That no man take thy crown. When you're talking about crown, we're talking about this. You're saved back here by grace through faith plus nothing. All right, you come along there, a lot of things you can lose. You can't lose salvation. All right, someday the Lord's going to come. You're going to be caught up and face the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 13. When you get up there, your work's going to burn. If any man suffer loss, so you can lose something there. And then if you did something for the Lord, you earn crowns. There are five crowns. Those crowns are the crown of glory, 1 Peter chapter 5, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the soul winner's crown, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and the crown of life, James chapter 1 verse 12, Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. All right, there are five crowns there that a Christian can win as an earned reward. He says, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown, implying you can lose a crown. Now, uh, the question is, how do you lose it? Well, he tells you how to lose it. Verse 9, verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine, this is a doctrinal thing he's talking about, of Christ hath not God, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not in your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. You know how you lose a crown, lose a full reward? When you promote and help and encourage people that don't believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context. The doctrine of Christ. Now, the doctrine of Christ covers a lot of things. For example, the doctrine of Christ covers the fact that he was God manifest in the flesh, that he was Jehovah God manifest in the flesh, that he came to save, and that he was the Jewish Messiah coming to die for your sins. Now, that's what is included in the name Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus came to save sinners. Christ anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah. That's the doctrine. Now, if a man doesn't abide in that doctrine, he's not saved, according to John. And according to John, he doesn't have the Son, doesn't have the Father. And according to John, if you help a guy like that out, you're not going to get a full reward. Now, one time, I got to read the one Bible, and it said, cast not that which is holy before, give not that which is holy to dogs, neither cast your pearl before the swine, lest they turn and rend you to pieces. Of that thing in Matthew. And I've heard all kinds of guys preaching that thing. And the standard way they preached on was this. It's no use trying to deal with that guy. You're just casting your pearls before swine. You know, like the college professor said, you know, when the class was over and the bell rang, they started to leave. He said, just a minute. I've got a few more pearls I want to cast. <laughs> but you know, the context of that passage about per, uh, dogs and swine is not talking about that. Over there in the second Peter chapter two verse twenty two it says the dog has returned to his vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Dog and a pig. That matches Matthew. Don't give that because holy the dogs, don't cast your pearl before swine. Now those dogs and the swine in the second Peter two twenty two are given in the first verse, where he says uh, he says in the last time uh, there shall be false teachers, false teachers, and false prophets among you who shall probably bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. 
B-O-U-G-H-T. Christ's blood bought unsaved prophets and unsaved teachers. Calvin was wrong again. No such thing as limited atonement. He said, those false teachers and prophets that went to hell denied the Lord that bought them. B-O-U-G-H-T. Blood paid for everybody. All right, now in 2 Peter 2, there's a false teacher and a false prophet. The false prophet's a male. The dog returned to his vomit. The false teacher's a female. The sound was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Don't take anything holy, anything that belongs to God, and give it to the dogs. False prophet. Neither cast your pearls before swine, the false teacher, lest they turn again and rend you. Now, what are the pearls? Well, the church is likened to a pearl of great price in Matthew chapter 13. Proverbs 31 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. A pearl is the only stone that's an organism. So it's a picture of the body of Christ. You can take a diamond, cut a diamond in two, you got two diamonds. You take a topaz or a jasper, cut it in two, you got two of them. You take a pearl and cut it in two, and you ruined it. All right, that pearl is one round, perfect unity. It's white, then washed white. It's formed by a disease secretion from an injured clam, an oyster down in the bottom of the ocean. It's formed by suffering. And a diver has to go down and get it, and bring it up. That's a blessing. You follow what I'm saying? <laughs> and when that thing comes up there, that thing is usually put in a necklace or a crown at a coronation for a king or a queen. And that's the picture of the saved people. All right, don't take the people you lead to Christ and turn them over to pigs and dogs. Otherwise what? You'll lose your reward. Verse 10. If there come any to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, good speed. May the Lord bless you, hasten you on your way, God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed, God help you, see, speed, like saying, Good luck, you know, God take care of you. He that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now, there's a thing back in the Old Testament that has to do with Samson. And old Samson is a perfect example of grace in the Old Testament just showing up unexpectedly and just taking care of a guy all the way. Samson never confesses his sin. He never judges him. He never gets right. So the Lord just banged his brains out all the way and then killed him. <laughs> and he's called one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And you take old Samson, the law of the Nazarite says he's to do this and this and this in number six. And then it says that all the days before this, these days are lost. So there's one thing a Nazarite can lose his rewards for. And I get, I, if I understand searching the Scripture, there's only one sin that a Christian can commit that will undo what he's done. In plain words, if you earn the reward, it's yours. But if I understand the passage, you can lose it on one grounds, and you lose it on the grounds that you company and fellowship and promote and cheer up and give, well, they say, giving comfort and aid to the enemy. In other words, when you go along with liberals and modernists and Jehovah Witnesses and people that deny the doctrine of Christ, the deity of Christ, you can lose some of the stuff that you've earned. Now, some people take it literal. We've got folks down south that says, we're seated not in your house. When Jehovah Witness knocks at the door, they won't even let him in the house because of that thing right there. See, take it literal. And of course, uh, John, as he means, he means a good reception. I mean, he means don't, he means... Don't say, come in, brother, have a seat, here's this, and help yourself, you know. They don't mean just not let him in the door, but you could press it that way if you wanted to. I like to let him in. <laughs> and then trap them. <laughs> and then you get in there, you know, and that, one of the best ways you can mess them up is to lead prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. If your witness ever come to your house, you say, before you start talking to me, don't you think we better have a word of prayer? And he'll try to back out. And then you start praying. And then you pray and you get, you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You watch that thing come all apart. Uh, there's something about those people that don't like to close a prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ said, ask, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and receive your joy may be full. And so I don't, I don't kick them out, but then when they go out the door, I don't say, the Lord bless you, brother, and, you know, pride, no, sir, I said, bye-bye, <laughs> and I'm on down the road. I had a couple of Mormons come by my house the other day. And, you know, 
Oh, uh, there's an old boy I listen to. I've got to meet with him in November. I love him. He's worse than I am, much worse. I'm very gentle alongside him. And his name is Alex Dunlap. He runs the Catholic Conversion Center in New Jersey. He prints a little track, you know, 10 Reasons Why I'm Not a Roman Catholic. And you talk about a character. I had a, I had a missionary conference with him in Tampa last January, and he got up and he said those uh, Mormons had on a certain kind of underwear. And he said they had a tab here and a tab here and a tab between the legs and tabs here. And though when they we got that underwear and went on their missionary work, those tabs represented the oath they took as a missionary that if they ever reveal any secrets of the inside Mormon high muckety muck, you know, that had their legs cut off, arms, so forth and so on. Well, I didn't really believe him when he said that, you know. He held up a piece of the underwear. He'd been out to Salt Lake City and bought him some in a store out there. And so I thought I'd just try it. And these Mormons got, I didn't invite them in, just stood between the screen door, me and them, and talked to them a while, you know, and talked to them a while. And uh, they saw they weren't getting anywhere. And one of them said, uh, finally got through, he said, well, we call upon God to witness, to bear witness the fact that we have testified to you and your blood is off our hands. Big impressive deal. And I said, and I call God to witness, bear record, I bore witness to you and your blood is off my hands. And I said, don't forget to change your underwear when you leave. And both those guys just turned white in the face. And one of them started to say something that didn't say it. I said, just funny underwear you got on. I said, wash it. Bam, slam the door. I'd like to throw them all to pieces, man. Now, you remember that if they ever come around. So you got on that pretty underwear today? All right, second. You know, whenever you find somebody that's got to put on something to prove something, it's because they haven't got anything. Did you know that? I mean, a collar on backwards, a kind of windmill sitting up on top of their head, you know, those spooks going up down the street, you know, in a different kind of underwear. You don't need all that junk. You know something, if you're saved, the, the devil could take everything you've got and couldn't take your salvation. I'd, I'm sure I'm glad I got a religion folks can't steal. Back in the Old Testament, the book of Judges, there's a guy named Micah, Micaiah, or Micah. And Micah, he has in the house full of gods, a graven image and a molten image and teraphim, you know, lying around there and an ephod and all this and that. And one day, he, some men from Dan come up there and they go in the house and they steal his priest, whom he called Father, by the way, and get his graven images and stuff and take it out of the house, go down the road, and old Micah gets on his horse and go chat out there and gets the posse and stops and says, where are you going, my gods? And one of those old boys from Dan turned around and said, boy, said, you better watch your mouth. Said, somebody will jump on you. He looks around there and sees about 500 men, their weapons standing around there, and he goes back to his house weeping because he lost his religion. Now, you know something? If you were a Catholic, or if you have any good Catholic friends, did you ever stop thinking what a mess they'd be in if you killed their priest and then burned their candles down and then threw away their beads and burned up their missile and bombed their church and killed their pope, see, and burned their Bible and threw away their uh, novenas and busted their statues and burned their pictures? Tell me something. What would they have left? Now, you know something about this? If you did that to me, you couldn't even affect my spiritual life. You couldn't burn my candles, I hadn't got me. You couldn't throw in my beads, I hadn't got any of them. If you, you could, if you killed my pastor, I've got a pastor up in heaven. You couldn't kill my priest, my priest's up in glory. If you burn my Bible, I've hid it in my heart. I'd just go back and sit down in the corner and say, I'm serving more song and be still the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Yeah, if God said you shall have a tree of the God, the woman said, I've ever tree of God need, but the tree of the middle garden, God has said you not take you, they even show to die. I'm a certain that I shan't show to die. But God doth know the day you eat there, your eyes be open, she'll be gone. No, a certain man do some. The younger said, Father, give him for it to good to follow me. So to buy them his living, and I made his after young gather will get him, because he turned to far country and waste something by living. There was a certain rich man made by a certain mega lady's gate, a couple of swords, right and fell and fell and fell. I want you can't burn that. It's inside me. The fellow says, well, I'm going to burn that song book. We don't memorize the song. <laughs> you can't do nothing with that. I'm that old Christian can get down there at the bottom of a, of a coal mine with that thing caved in on his head to see and can't see nothing in his head, you know, and he's down there in the dark suffocating and dying and singing, the light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, da-da-da-da-da, you know. Well, that's happened, boy. 
They 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 uh they they, they bought up one of those miners, one of those coal things where about ninety of them got killed. They rescued about ten of them after a week and got them up there and they asked one fellow, said, What'd you do down there in the dark? You, you, this is never on the per, per front page, you know, it's always back four pages over. And said, so, what'd you do down in the dark? He said, I sang the greatest song the world's ever known. And the reporter says, what's that, you know? And then he sorry asked, <laughs> yeah, what's that, you know? And this fellow says, uh, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And that guy's down in the dark singing, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. <laughs> and he can't see his hand in front of his face. You know, if you're saved, you've got a light in you that in a coal mine, 800 feet below ground is brighter than the light of the Statue of Liberty. Amen, brother. All right, verse 11. For he that bid him God to speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I write, would not write with paper and ink, too much to write. But I trust to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Verse 13 will close here. The children of my elect sister, who are those? I haven't got an idea in this world. The children of my elect sister, greet thee. Amen.